All right, we're still in Acts. This is part 10 of a series that we're going through looking at what spirit-filled living is supposed to look like. We're looking at what, what we're supposed to do to get past false concepts of the Christian life, to lay aside these, these unreal ways that we think, because of what culture tells us, the Christian life is supposed to look like, and actually set this all aside and get a fresh, fresh perception of, of the Christian life that lines up with God's idea of, of normal. So I guess the first question is, just to start off today, what gets us there? What is it that, that plays into spiritual formation, if you want to call it that, that, that plays into enabling us to grow up in faith? And I was thinking about this that this week, and I came across, I came across this, this article. And it was um, an article that, that referenced a survey on the whole idea of spiritual formation. Thousands of people were asked the basic question, when did you grow the most spiritually, and what contributed to that growth? The number one contributor was not great teaching. It was not being a part of a small group. It was not awesome worship. The number one, the number one contributing factor was crisis and pain. Crisis and pain was number one. Good news, right? Okay, I guess what that means is, I guess, that we need to figure out how to create more crisis per attendee for maximum spiritual growth. I mean, if you want to get real about it, right? Well, you know that's not true because you've got enough crisis of pain coming in without us being purposeful about, about looking for it. Now, you know, seriously, crisis and pain does not automatically and always bring good things. You, you know that. I mean, it brings wounding, it brings scars, it brings troubles that, that some people actually don't get past. But nevertheless, it, it's something that, that does some things in us that nothing else seems to be able to do. Today we're at Acts chapter 12, and we're going to see how, how crisis here actually began to teach the early church a little bit about what this, this real Christian life was supposed to look like. Began to teach them a little bit more about the purposes that God had for them and how he intended them to go about reaching those purposes. I mean, what we're going to do today is look at, at basically how to call 911 and see that God is there to hear the call in, in the crisis situations and how he comes in, in in time of need. So what we have in Acts chapter 12 is an introduction where we see that one of the, the famous apostles, James, has actually been beheaded by Herod. He's been killed. And Herod sees that everybody kind of pr approved of this. At least the Jewish authority seems to have approved of this beheading. So he figures he'll keep playing to the crowd, and he has Peter arrested and imprisoned, and Peter is just about to be executed. Let's look at Acts 12, verses 1 to 5, and see how, how it's laid out here. It says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer, fervent prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, this is where we, we you know, kind of leave off, and I'll just tell you from the, the, the beginning here, we're going to be looking at how prayer played into this, this matter of crisis management, how, how prayer played an essential role in, in how they addressed the crisis. But let's go on through the story here first. What we see here first is that Peter's imprisoned, and what the church does is they rallied together and prayed. They didn't rally together to worry. H have you noticed how sometimes when we, we get into a situation where crisis comes, we rally together, but where, where do we spend the first 10 minutes of the rallying together? I mean, basically with this mutual hand-wringing that comes out, as opposed to the focus of where the attention is supposed to, supposed to be. Now, it shifts focus here after we're told that the, the church has gathered together and they're praying for Peter, and then it's describing the situation that Peter's in. It says here, beginning of verse 6 and going on through, that Peter is sleeping. Now, this is kind of interesting, because this is the night before Peter's about to be beheaded. And here he is sleeping. I can't even sleep on an airplane. And yet here's Peter sleeping when he knows that he's about to be beheaded the, the next day. I mean, it, it, it points to something about him, I think, that's a little bit similar to what we see with Jesus. Remember when Jesus was sleeping in a storm in a rowboat? 
I mean, he's sleeping in the midst of crises because he apparently has some kind of peace that's going on here with him. It, what happens then is an angel strikes him. Now, this is kind of funny, really, when you think about it, because Peter's sleeping, and an angel comes up to wake him up. The angel, it doesn't seem like, is able to wake him up by just saying, hey, Peter, wake up. And the angel has to kick the guy, it sounds like, to get Peter to wake up. Now, Peter, Peter does finally get waked up. And then it says, another thing that's interesting is you read the details here. It says, get dressed. Now, this is interesting because Peter's chained between two guys. He's laying there between two guys chained. If I were laying there between two guys chained, I wouldn't have had my clothes off in the first place. But Peter's told he's got to get up and get dressed, and he does it. And then, and then we go on with the rest of the story. Peter gets up, gets dressed, and he starts following this angel out. But Peter thinks he's dreaming. He doesn't think it's a real deal. He's like walking in a fog. And then finally, as you get halfway through the chapter, and he's all the way out of the prison he finally realizes, hey, this is the real deal. I'm really awake. An angel really did come in here and, and, and rescue me. And then, and then he decides to go over where the church is gathered together praying. And then this is where it really gets interesting. Now, the church, remember, they, they've gathered together and they're praying. This is the middle of the night, right? So they've been praying, it looks like, all night. And what happens? Peter knocks on the door, and this servant girl, Rhoda, comes to the door, opens the door, sees it's Peter, but is so surprised that she sees him that she doesn't even let him in the house, but turns around and tells everybody else. And everybody else, these, these, these people who are so strong in faith, when she says Peter's at the door, they go, oh, no way, he can't be at the door, he's in prison. He's in prison, it must be his angel. Now think about the context of what's going on here. These are people that have been praying their hearts out, praying praying passionately, praying fervently. And what, what happens when the prayer gets answered? They don't even believe it's possible that the prayer was answered. I mean, it's like they're going through some religious exercise here, but we really didn't expect anything to happen. We just thought we ought to be doing this because we feel so sorry for Peter. But, but he was freed. But he did get out. But God did come through. And they're praying obviously had, had something to do with this. So what I'd like to do just for the next few minutes we're together here this morning is look at this whole idea of crisis and, and, and praying and kind of examine it. I mean, I, I think a good question to start with is, okay, why is praying even a thing, really? I mean, why is praying e even a thing? Why did, why did they need to be play, praying? Why is, is a great place to start. I was... Um, read a book a while back. You probably, some of you probably read it too. It's a book called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. I mean, in fact, if you don't want to read the whole book, you can go to his TED Talk, which is one of the top three TED Talks in, in all of history. Uh, the premise of his TED Talk and his book is this. It's why is the question that really needs success? It's the question that must be answered before we look at the hows and whats of life. Because why, the why question for people, is about the beliefs that we have that are behind the what's and the, the, the how's that we, we do, the, the how's that we do in going about the what's that we have. The why, the why question, why we're doing what we're doing means more than what we're doing or how we're going about it. So again, I think this applies to praying. Why, why is it that we pray? You're going, well, this is sounding confusing already, and it is, but it's going to get simpler. The idea is we need to ask why we're praying because as we understand why we pray, as we understand the underlying premises of, of prayer, I think it puts us in a better position to actually jump into it with, with both feet the way we're supposed to. I mean, the, the big idea, I think, is, is very simple. You and I were created to be dependent upon God. I mean, it's as simple as that. We were designed by God to be dependent upon Him. He likes it when we come to Him in this, this sense of childlike dependency, it gives them glory, and it's where he pours out his, his mercy on us as we, as we do it. I mean, the idea is, if this is true, and in, in, in the Bible says it is, then why in the world would we ever choose to try to go about life on our own, as opposed to having this dependency upon God? I think part of the, the issue is wrapped up... Um, in the, the temptation of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, where two foundational lies 
came into play, and they're two foundational lies that continue to, to plague us. Uh, they've been believed somehow by, by every person who, who's ever lived. I mean, as a parent, you've seen the acceptance of them in, in your kids from an early age. The first lie is the lie of autonomy, the lie of autonomy. And that's the lie that, that this life belongs to you, the lie that, that you have the right to live life as you please in living it. But, but the doctrine of creation destroys this, this lie. I mean, the idea, again, is if, if I've created a, a painting, for example, I own the painting. Now, I can choose to, to give it away, I can choose to sell it, but, but unless I do, it's mine. And with creation, we've got to face up to the, the fact that God created you and me. And so we don't own our personality, we don't own our, our emotions, we don't own our mentality. I mean, it's... It's true that we're owned by God. And this idea of autonomy is, is truly a, a lie. The second lie is self-sufficiency. And it's the idea that you have everything within you to be and do what you're supposed to do. But again, the truth is we were created to be dependent first on God and second on, on relationships with each other. And self-sufficiency is, is destructive because it it comes in and puts us in a place of, of resisting help from God, which is exactly what we were created to, to need. I mean, while we were created to be dependent, and it's the way we're designed, we have to choose to be that way. We've got to choose to operate as dependent children. We've got to choose to, to step away from the lie of autonomy, to step away of the lie of self-sufficiency, and we've got to choose to acknowledge how God put us together and to, to enter into life as it's supposed to be lived. God chooses not to control the way we think about these things. And, and Satan can't control the way we think about these things. We're the gatekeepers of our own thoughts, and we've got to choose to agree with God's truth in our thought life. It's what Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. The, the idea with this, with, with praying, and, and with this whole matter of praying in faith, again, it starts with the idea that we're dependent upon God. It, it continues from there with the idea that God's a good father who is going to honor our dependence upon him with good, good things. But, but it's a matter of actually getting to the point where we, we have an attitude that moves along in line with this. You know, attitudes are something that, that we have some ability to shape. Well, what, what's an attitude, really? An attitude is simply nothing more than a habit of thinking. An attitude is a habit pattern of thinking. And what we've got to become are people that think in line with the revelation from God. People who, who live by and think by revelation and not by the speculation of, of coming up with our own ideas about how things work. And as we begin the habit of thinking in line with revelation, what does that do? The habit patterns of thinking create attitudes. And faith, in a sense, can be seen as simply an attitude. Faith is a habit of thinking in line with God's revelation. And as we develop that habit, we develop the attitude of faith. As we develop that, that, that habit, we develop the attitude of, of dependence upon God. And, and we move away from this lie, again, of autonomy, the, the lie of, of self-sufficiency. And we, we get to the place where God really has always intended us to be, to be this people of, of, of faith. I mean, it, it's... It's something that, that's still troubling because you say, okay, well, I believe that. I, I do. I believe that I'm created to be dependent upon God. I believe that, that I need God. I believe that, that, yes, I'm supposed to be somebody who prays to God. But, you know, let's get real. Sometimes prayer works and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I'm looking really at, at Acts chapter 12, and I'm thinking, you know, James just got beheaded. He got killed. Was nobody praying for James? What was going on there? Well, it doesn't say anybody was praying for him, but I don't know what the truth was behind that. But what we do see is somebody certainly was praying for Peter. So we go by what the revelation is that's provided here. So I, I guess the question is, when, when can we count on God hearing us? When can we count on our prayers being, being effective, or at least more effective than, than other times? And again, let's, let's look at just a few examples from, from what we see in Scripture and how this works. So when, 
when can we count on prayers being more effective? First thing, number one, number one thing right off the bat is when we vocalize our requests to God. When we vocalize our requests to God. You know, sometimes you can play head games with this whole idea of God's sovereignty. And you can say, well, you know, if God knows the beginning from the end, if God understands what's going on in my life, if God knows what I need before I need it, then why do I need to ask him for anything? It's because, again, he set up his universe and he set up the relationship that he has with you and me as one that rests upon this dependency, a dependency that increases intimacy of relationship in the process. So he wants us to vocalize our request to him. James 4.2. James 4.2 says, you don't have because why? Because you don't ask. You don't have because you, you don't ask for the things that you need. You can't just sit there and say, you know, I'm thinking good thoughts about Peter. It's, it's this actual engagement with the requests that, that come into play with him. There's a story um, that we see in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 18, verses 35 to 43. And what happens in that story is Jesus is, you know, doing his thing, going into the, the towns, doing ministry. And he comes across this blind guy sitting on the side of the road, a guy named Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. And the blind guy is obviously blind, and he's crying out to Jesus, 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 help me, help me. And people are telling him to quiet down, quiet down, and he doesn't quiet down. He just keeps yelling louder, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me. And, and Jesus comes over to him. And it's kind of interesting that the dialogue that, that you see, Jesus says to this guy, who is obviously blind, what do you want me to do? I want to hear you say it. I want to hear you say it. And he makes Bartimaeus speak it out. He makes him vocalize the request to him. I'm blind and I want to see. I want you to give me my sight. I mean, this is, again, a very simple thing. But but it looks like a lot of us must overlook this sometimes because it's repeated over and over in Scripture, this idea of of vocalizing, this idea of actually speaking out. Psalm 77, Psalm 77, uh, 1 Says, says it very simply. My voice rises to God and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God and then he will hear me. How does he hear us unless we, we raise our voice to him? Yeah, I know God knows our thoughts. Yes, there's nothing that's beyond his understanding and knowledge. But this is something that he's put upon us to do as a matter of what? Of faith. Of faith. So again, we... We set aside our concepts, our speculation about how he operates, and we replace it with the the revelation of how he says that he he operates. Second thing, second thing that we see in terms of of seeing effective prayer come in is actually very simply to get others to pray for you. I mean, there is this idea that, that there's increased effectiveness when more people pray. I mean, sometimes you might ask the question, I mean, does it make any difference if one person, two people, ten people are praying? Well, it it looks like it does. I mean, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19 was asking the entire church, pray for me, pray for me. I mean, this is the Apostle Paul who's had a face-to-face with Jesus who's saying, I need you guys. In addition to me praying, I need you guys to pray for me that I can be effective in what God has put me here to do. I believe there's a power that comes in with with that effectiveness. Uh, Jesus said the same thing in in a different way. In the Gospels where he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, where two or three agree on something together, there's there's a multiplied power that, that comes into play. And again, we're seeing it right here in Acts chapter 12, this multiplied power that's coming in as, as the church is, is gathered together, gathered together to, to pray for, for Peter. I mean, what we see, the church learning here, is that, that, that prayer matters. Sometimes, sometimes what happens is we, we get together and we'll pray for God to give us strategies. But we overlook the idea that prayer is the strategy, and I think that, that this is something that they were starting to learn here in, in Acts, the early church, that they really didn't need to pray for strategies, that prayer was a strategy. In fact, as you go on through the book of Acts, you don't see too many apostolic strategy meetings on, on how they're to go about with different methodologies, this extension of the kingdom. They just pray for power. They just pray for faith to be released. They pray for people to repent 
they, they pray for the obvious things that, again, God has revealed need to come into play in order for his kingdom to be extended. Third thing, third thing that we, we see as we look at this whole matter of, of effective praying in, in the, the New Testament, the Gospels also particularly, is a um, matter of name power, name power, pure and simple. That matter that you're familiar with, I'm sure, of, of praying in Jesus' name. I mean, really, what's that all about? What's that all about, praying in Jesus' name? Is it something that really matters? I mean, is it just like a superstitious tag on that we have to put in play every time that we pray? Well, again, it's a matter of revelation. It's a matter of revelation that Scripture provides in terms of how we're to pray. I mean, just in, just in the book of John, without looking any further this week, I see Jesus teaching about prayer. And he says in John 14, 13, Whatever you ask in my name, in the name of Jesus, that I'll do. In in verse 14 of John 14, if you ask me anything in my name, that's what I will do. John John, John 16, 23 and, and 24, he says, in that day you'll not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Anyway, he goes on. I'm not going to read all of them to you. He goes on five separate times in the book of John and says, ask it in my name, ask it in my name, ask it in my name, ask it in my name. And, and repeating something five times in, in, that short, in that short a section as he teaches on the prayer makes me think that this is something he wants to reveal to us something that he wants to make sure we get and that we understand, that we, we do have this matter of praying in his name in terms of, of how, we go about, how we go about doing it. Um, the, the idea, though, is, is that, okay, well, what's that really mean, though? What does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? What's going on? Well, uh, two things, two things. Number one, number one, as we pray in Jesus' name, we're coming before the Father with the acknowledgement that, that we understand we've got no access to the Father except by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've got no access to the Father in our natural state, but rather it's by his imputed righteousness. The perfect life that Jesus Christ lived has been put upon us. That, that as we come before the Father, he sees us in the perfection of Jesus as we come in with the request. So, so that is, is an acknowledgement that should be something that builds us up in faith as we remind ourselves of the, the identity we have as we come in, the identity that we have as we come in. And then, and then the second thing, and this is you know, a little more abstract, but, but think about it. In, in 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, John, who wrote all of that about speaking in the name of Jesus, says this. He says, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Now, this twists it around. Before, in John, it was talking just about if we ask anything in his name, we get it. Now it's saying if we ask anything in his will, we get it. Well, I think part of it is there's a connection that comes in with asking in Jesus' name with this matter of it being his will. Because I, I think part of what we're talking about here as we're, we're getting the revelation of, of prayer is that as we ask in Jesus' name, we're saying that we want the things that are in his name and therefore in his will. Uh, Tim Keller, Tim Keller said it this way. He said that God will either, God will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything he knew. And, and I think this is the connection point that we see as we're, we're looking at this matter of, of praying in Jesus' name. It's praying in, in faith. It's praying with faithfulness. It's believing and it's, it's obeying. And, and then last thing we'll look at today in terms of what it's talking about here. Effective prayer also is a matter of understanding that persistence is required that persistence is required. You know, we, we, again, sometimes create our own little theology and says, God's not hard of hearing. God doesn't have to be asked more than once. God remembers what we ask of him, and therefore we're going to ask it and let it go, and we're going to leave the results to God. Well, again, that's, that's a fine-sounding idea, but that's speculation. Revelation says you ask and you keep asking. 
Revelation is based upon the, the, the parables that Jesus told. I mean, beginning with the, the story about the widow who, who bugged the judge at his house. The widow who has a court hearing coming up, she doesn't wait for her court date. She goes to the judge's house, for goodness sakes, and starts banging on his door. And he says, wow, she's not going to stop. I know her. She doesn't know quit. So she's going to keep on going until I give her what she wants. So I'm going to give her what she's asking for. And Jesus is using that as, as an example of, of how we're supposed to be praying to the Father, for goodness sakes. I mean, again, this is the idea that, that persistence is supposed to be a part of it, that, that persistence is an indication of faith. Persistence is an indication that we really do believe that, that we're somebody with a standing to come before the Father and that the Father hears us and that he just, I mean, sometimes it looks like he just likes hearing us so much he wants us to keep repeating it over and over again. And, and this is what's, what's happening, a persistence that comes in that, that plays into effectiveness in prayer. And unfortunately, I think some people, some of us, me too, we give up too quickly. We just stop before we get what we could have got because God has, has a season that he wants to teach us to persevere through many times. Um, you may have read about this before, too. It's a, a, an article on standardized testing. Standardized testing with Japanese children um, show that they consistently score higher than American kids on mathematic standardized testing. Now, some assu assume that it's because of a natural ability that Asians have in math, but, but researchers have discovered that it likely has a lot more to do with effort than with ability. I mean, in one study with first graders, students were, giving, were given a, a difficult puzzle to solve, but the researchers were not really interested in whether or not the kids could solve the puzzle. They simply wanted to see how long they would try before giving up. The American kids lasted an average of 9.47 minutes. The Japanese kids, 13.93 minutes. And that is Japanese kids tried 47% longer than the American kids did. And the researchers concluded that the difference in the mass scores had less to do with, with IQ than with PQ, that is persistence quotient, because the Japanese kids simply tried harder. I mean, what you get to with this, really, when you take it out to any place else, athletics, music, business, I mean, success seems to be a derivative of persistence. And we're seeing that revealed in Scripture, too. That, that success, that is, the whole idea of effective prayer is, is something that's consistent with persistence. I mean, persistence seems to be the, the magic bullet in, in all of this. And we want to see how, how that comes into play and what we're supposed to be doing with it in terms of how to live this out with, with audacity and tenacity in praying. And, and it's just a matter of getting our, our faith in the right place. It's a matter of stirring each other up. In the Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, there's a verse that, verse that a lot of folks are familiar with. It says that we come together as a church to, to stir each other up to love and good deeds. Now, sometimes we, we think about that in just this, this nice, kind fashion of coming alongside each other and saying nice things to encourage each other up. But, but I think part of it is, is this Hebrews 10, 24, encouraging one another, stirring one another up, is, is a matter of prodding one another. It's a matter of, of getting, getting on each other sometimes about breaking free of spiritual lethargy, breaking free of stupid thinking, breaking free into the revelation of what God has said about who we are, how, we to live, how we're living, and what's in front of us. I mean, what we're supposed to do is prodding, is to be prodding each other and to ask some uncomfortable questions sometimes of each other, you know, in your small groups. How's your prayer life going? How's your prayer life going? I mean, are you persistent? Are you pushing through? Are you doing it? How much time are you doing with it? I mean, not that time is necessarily always, always lined up with how effective prayer is going to be, but, I mean, it does seem to have something to do with effectiveness in every other area of life, so it looks like the time we spend in it has got something to do with the effectiveness that we're going to have in the spiritual life that God has laid out in front of us. I mean, the idea for a lot of us, I think, is to back up a little bit and see how life's going. I mean, is there a dream that you've given up on? Is there, is there an issue, a crisis that you've stepped back from and said, I've just got to leave that with God? Is there something going on that, that you're thinking, okay, I'm just tired of praying for this? 
And the idea is it's time to step up again. It's time to step into the battle that you're supposed to be involved in. It's time to remember that what we're involved in here is, is a war where we've got God on our side, but we've got an enemy that, that's opposing us. And it's a war, unfortunately, that's kind of convoluted because it's a war in which we're also being grown up at the same time. Have you ever thought about the conflict that comes in with that? That we are being matured and brought up in the middle of crisis and pain and suffering and it's a war that we're in with the crisis and pain and suffering. It's like putting a bunch of, of eight-year-old boys on the battlefield. I mean, that's kind of how it is for us sometimes when you look at this spiritual life. But nevertheless, that's the way God has put it together for us. And we're supposed to be engaging in this with the effectiveness that, that is going to bring about different changes. I mean, the only way that we, we fail in, in terms of, of prayer is, is basically when we, we give up. And so, what, what's the application with all of this? The application, hopefully, is pretty obvious, that we, we walk out of here today with the commitment before God that I'm a dependent person, God. I don't, I don't know how to be completely dependent other than praying, and I'm going to enter in at a new level with, with all of this. I'm going to enter in and bring my crises before you by praying, by verbalizing what this is about, by getting other people to pray with me and for me in this, by getting past the pride that keeps me from saying, my marriage is on the rocks, can you help me with this? By getting past the pride that says, that says whatever it is that you're keeping private so that nobody else is joining into the battle with you, by, by being persistent and keeping at it with a faith in the goodness of God, with a faith in the power of God that comes in, with a faith in the power of the name of Jesus Christ that enters in. Again, it's got to do with what we believe. It's got to do with how we really think God operates in, in terms of his, 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 his universe. I mean, we're, we're given some specifics in all of this. I mean, healing, what does James 5 say? I mean, James 5 says, call for the church, call for the elders of the church, call for people to enter in and pray for you. I mean, with, with imprisonment, with whatever bondage you're in, joining in in corporate prayer for, for people that are stuck that way makes a difference. Marriage, marriage. I mean, there's a, I mean, I guess you guys have probably heard the study before we've preached on it here, Ryan and I, several times, but this, this really interesting statistic that shows that only 8% of Christian couples actually pray for each, or each other out loud, out loud. And the study goes on to show that, that less than 1% of couples who do pray for each other out loud daily ever got divorced. I mean, Dr. Phil on his show um, quoted this statistic in a different way, saying that an interesting statistic reflects that the divorce rate in America is at a minimum one out of two marriages. But, but the reported divorce rate among couples that pray together out loud daily is about 1 in 10,000. But do we do it? Is that the answer that we look to? Is that what we, we step into and engage in? I mean, it's on a personal level, but just closing up real quickly, we need to take it to a corporate level too. You know, that Christmas Eve service that we, we are looking at here is, is an effort, another effort to extend the kingdom. And so one thing you can add to your prayers for the month of, of December is simply that, that God draws people in, that God gives you, gives you the, the name of one person that you can be bringing in, that you can be praying for their salvation, that you can be, be praying that you have a, a, a hand in their eternal outcome. I mean, again, it's about us believing that that life is more than this life, that it goes on forever in heaven or in hell, and, and that we want to be about the extension of the kingdom in every way possible, seeing people come to know Jesus. And so, again, the challenge is for, for December to be, to be praying for, for the Lord to pour out his, his power, his mercy on people on Christmas Eve, for you to be able to engage and invite at least one person, maybe more in, for you to gather together maybe in, in smaller groups and be praying for there to be an impact in terms of the kingdom of God being extended in Kona, for the Holy Spirit to come and bring revival in Kona. It's part of what you have as, as your job description if this is where God's placed you in part of, as part of his kingdom here. Anyway, all of it's a matter of choice. All of it's a matter of choice. We choose to step into what God has created us to be and do we choose to acknowledge our dependency upon him, or we choose 
to continue to, to go the way of the world and just say, hey, I, I'm an autonomous being. I can take care of myself. I, I really don't need to complicate my life with, with all of this stuff. But again, again, what's the gauge of reality and truth? What everybody else around us is doing or the revelation that God's provided? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your amazing love for us. We thank you for the provision that you've made for relationship with you. We thank you for the revelation of your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your death on the cross for us. I just ask now, Holy Spirit, that you'd move, that you'd wake us up, that you'd wake us up, that you'd wake us up this moment to reality, that you'd wake us up this moment to truth, that you'd wake us up to a sensitivity to, to what you've told us in terms of, of the, the design that you have for each one of us, the, the fact that we've been created as dependent beings, the fact that you're glorified and pleased when we come before you, the fact that, that, that the humility that's required to ask other people to pray with us is, is something that, that releases grace. I just ask that you move us, move us, Father, to become what you've told us you want us to be, a, a, a church that, that is marked by prayer, that we truly become a people that together can be called a house of prayer. I ask you to move us past strategies that get in the way that attempt to replace your strategy of, of dependent prayer on you, Father. I ask you to simplify things for us and enable us to see that effectiveness, even right now today. And I ask it in the power of Jesus' name. Amen.